300 years ago, this land was known only to Native Americans, the Indians who camped at the base of the notch in the mountains. But in time, long after European immigrants had settled here to build new lives in an atmosphere of political freedom and religious tolerance, this place became an army camp known as Fort Indian Town Gap. Today, there are new immigrants at Fort Indian Town Gap. They are refugees from Indochina who suddenly were thrust from their homelands many in fear of their lives. Some were forced to leave behind loved ones and wealth, perhaps for good. Interned here at this aging army camp in Pennsylvania and in other camps in Arkansas and California, they spend their days waiting, waiting for American sponsors and a chance to begin again. These strangers in a new land are a long way from home, both in miles and in culture. Waiting, they live in limbo, thinking about the old life and wondering about the new. The purpose of this program is to acquaint you with the refugees and their lives from the time of their arrival until now, and to examine the progress and the problems on the way to closing the gap. <laughs> This is Bob Larson inside the refugee area at Fort Indian Town Gap, Pennsylvania. This spring, more than 120,000 refugees were evacuated from Vietnam and Cambodia and transported to military camps in California, Florida, Arkansas, and here in Pennsylvania. For more than four months, the refugees who have not yet found American sponsors have been confined to the areas defined by these white tapes. During the hot days this summer, even the nearby mountains were off limits to the refugees. And if sponsors aren't found, they will be trying to keep warm this winter in these uninsulated barracks. Although they share a common heritage in the plight of being strangers in a new land, the Indo-Chinese refugees are individuals who have come from a wide variety of backgrounds. Most of them are Vietnamese, some are Cambodian. Among them are sophisticated city dwellers and farmers and fishermen. Many are well-educated and some are not. There are highly trained professionals among them, and some are soldiers who have known only fighting. There are old people and young, and more than half are children. How old are you? Five. Five, thank you. No, five years old. Five years old. How are you? Five, thank you. Good. What is your name? My name is Salofa. You speak English very well. Win Hun Tree is a teacher and an architect. She and Win Tran Kuok, a professor from the University of Delart, who have known each other for seven years, were married in the refugee camp this summer. Tony Tohan is a Montagnard, educated in Europe and a former minister for minority affairs in Vietnam. He is trying to keep alive his cultural heritage. Wintry Tu was a secretary in Vietnam, the wife of a Vietnamese Air Force officer. She managed to escape with her infant son and her brother and has been futilely trying to locate her husband. Most of the refugees, like Tien Dao, ex-soldier whose wife and baby failed to escape from Da Nang, have had tragedy in their lives. I always have in mind, after I left Vietnam, that nowhere is my home and anywhere can be my home. The Indo-Chinese are political refugees like the Cubans and Hungarians who arrived in the 50s and 60s. But politics seem unimportant indeed when contrasted to their human needs. The Indo-Chinese refugees are not a great number of people for this country to absorb when compared to other ethnic groups that have been assimilated. But the Indo-Chinese arrived all at one time and they had no established groups of fellow countrymen here to receive them. Ethnically, they are quite alone. It's unique in one sense only that a substantial number of refugees, 130,000 of them, came to the United States within a very short period of time, oh, eight weeks, is that right. about it? Okay. And uh, could not therefore be absorbed immediately into the mainstream of American life, but had to be taken to camps. 
the uh, Vietnamese, they came a long way and into an entirely different world. Now, we had the Hungarian refugees, I was in Austria at the time, who came about 190,000, who came within three months over the border. But they were in Europe and they had, many had relatives and, and friends and families there, and it was much easier for them. But I think that you have to take into consideration the fact that there is no ethnic base for the Indo-Chinese refugees in this country. There was a, a Hungarian base and there was a Cuban base. And that's probably a pretty significant factor in, in uh, not only the, the uh, visibility, if you will, that, that uh, sponsoring out Indo-Chinese refugees might have, but also probably addresses some of the difficulties that we might run across with that. When their countries fell, the refugees from Vietnam and Cambodia fled amidst confusion and fear. Some fled because they had been closely affiliated with Americans. And for some, already refugees in their own countries, the evacuation was the final push from their homelands. I suppose the uh, propellants, if you will, about why they wanted to leave are varied. There were people in the government, the government apparatus, of course, once the North Vietnamese took over, uh, was very much in danger. Uh, there was a large intellectual community in the academic world and the media that were very much in danger because they had uh, verbalized their political views uh, quite extensively for a period of years. There were a great many people who worked for the U.S. government who, by the very nature of that association, felt that they were in some considerable jeopardy. And I think in the background of that, one has to establish the fact that a great many of these were people who had fled the North in the 50s and come on down to the South, escaping what they felt then was the communist threat and who felt it only on a more intensive basis. So it's fear combined with a lot of other rational backups, if you will, that brought these people out. I know of uh, only the one or two cases where force seemed to have been uh, part of it. I think it was the case of 13 people who had been allegedly drugged and so on. But that's not what we're dealing with in the 130,000 people that are in the United States. Saigon fell in late April. People panicked in their attempts to flee. I was besieged every day, both at the office. Uh, when I went home, there were families waiting for me, some of whom I knew and some who were strange to me. Uh, and when I would wake up for breakfast before going off to work, uh, the guard from the house would come in and tell me about another 20 families who had come in. And they had one plea to get out. Uh, I would only uh, have to guess, but it would be in the magnitude, in my judgment, of perhaps as many as 750,000 to 1 million who would have wanted to come out if it was possible to take them out. They want to get away from the war. I mean, you know, all these years of, of, of war, of 32 years, you know, they, they, they were afraid from their about children. And, and as the war came near, they wanted to get away. On April 18th, while evacuations were taking place, President Ford announced that 12 federal agencies would coordinate and form an interagency task force on refugees from Indochina. The military mobilized special units trained to handle disasters to organize camps and prepare housing for the refugees. The refugees were delivered to camps in the Philippines, Guam, and Wake. And after the grueling last legs of their journeys, there began the oft-repeated scene of weary refugees arriving by the plane loads at refugee camps in Fort Pendleton, California, Fort Chaffee, Arkansas, Eglin Air Force Base in Florida, and at Fort Indian Town Gap, Pennsylvania. Then began the long hours of being processed, of temporarily settling in once more, and of waiting. Uh, Guam was uh, a uh, expeditious thing it had to be set up with uh, tents and the best we could do with the fastest means which means we go in with tents and uh, you know the, the maximum amount of facilities so it would be by our standards be somewhat uh, say permanent but uh, talking with the refugees they, they were there about uh, anywhere from 10 to 20 days uh, and then they were moved on to one of the camps in the states where they had the combinations that they have here the hard uh, the barracks uh, with the mess halls and all so uh, as talking to some, uh, they said this is really great because uh, coming out of Vietnam, they came out on a barge to, uh, to some island where they had nothing. They went to Guam where they had tents, and then they came here to uh, Indian Town Gap where they had a, uh, a very nice uh, uh, place to stay. I've been in two camps in Camp um, uh, Fort Chaffee, and 
in, here in Indian Town. And I was very much surprised and the how everything was organized. I came here 12 days after it started and I walked through the camp and I didn't believe my eyes that it could have been done that quickly. And uh, what impressed me most was there was no noise, no, anybody was shouting in spite of the fact that it's a military camp. There was no way to protect people who were uprooted as these people were and removed thousands of miles from their homes without knowledge of where hope was coming from. There was no way of uh, really protecting them completely from despair, but that there were ways of making them feel that there was hope. And essentially, I think what I said to the commanding people was that uh, you should treat these people like you treat your neighbor or your friend or your brother. If his house was burned out or flooded, you reach out, you touch them, you hold them, you give them a sense that they still have a lot of worth and that there are people that still love them and want to help them. More than three-fourths of the refugees evacuated from Indochina now have been sponsored and have left the camps. The people who remain at the camps spend their days waiting and watching others leave for new homes. They wait to be called for an interview, hoping for a sponsor, and they worry about life on the outside. Bolstering up sagging spirits and fighting the homesickness and boredom is a continuing effort for everyone in the refugee camps and singing familiar old songs seems to help. This is a performance by refugee folk singers who recently toured Fort Indian Town Gap and Fort Chaffee. Buồn câu buồn câu trà chú tu hú tu hú trà anh qua tranh qua tranh trà chị qua đi qua đi trà ta con gà con gà trà ông nó buồn câu buồn câu trà chú tu hú tu hú trà anh qua tranh qua tranh trà chị qua đi qua đi trà ba con gà con gà trà ông nghe không chú bé lấy lại con cung chú bé lấy lại con cơ Thứ nhất là để nối lại cái sự giao cảm giữa người Việt chúng ta sau 4 tháng bị dao động. Tom Zui, a Vietnamese songwriter who performed with his wife and daughter, talked to the audience about reconciliation and adjustment. And singer Con Lee urged the refugees not to forget Vietnam and their heritage. A fan of Con Lee's when he worked in Vietnam, Rich Fuller, now a caseworker with the International Rescue Committee, joined in the entertainment. That I'd like to do is called A Mother's Heritage, which is also written by Trinh Công Sang, sung by many children in Vietnam, and was even on TV uh, during a recording in one of the C-141s that brought some of the refugees here. It capsulizes the history of Vietnam in three short verses. Thousand years of Chinese reign, a hundred years of French domain, twenty years fighting brothers each day, a mother's fate left for her child, a mother's fate, a land defied. Years of Chinese reign, a hundred years of French domain, twenty years fighting brothers each day, a mother's fate, bones left to dry in grave that fill a mountain high. Teach your children to speak their minds, don't let them forget their kind, never forget their kind from old Vietnam. Mother, wait for your kids to come home Kids who now so far away roam Children of one father be reconciled A 
thousand years of Chinese reign, a hundred years of French domain. While stubbornly maintaining their own identity throughout their long history, the Indo-Chinese have had to adapt to the Chinese and French cultures. Now the refugees in this country must adapt once more. And learning English is a major concern. The Coca-Cola is cold. The Coca-Cola is cold. The Coca-Cola is cold. The Coca-Cola is cold. Although many are bilingual and well-educated, most often their second language is French. This summer, survival English classes for adults taught by volunteer teachers were well attended. The students participated as if their livelihoods depended on it. And they do. Yes. You see, on page 63, size uh, 14, 16. Do you have any questions? Okay. This is size. How big? Okay. Size. 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 Yeah. Size. Size. The refugee camps are run by a loose confederation of the military and government agencies. The military oversees the housing, food, and medical needs of the refugees. The mess halls are run by the military and are manned by a private contractor. The refugees say that the food is plentiful and quite good, but they miss their favorite condiment, a fish sauce called nukmam. However, with soy sauce as a substitute, they manage to impart an oriental flavor to mess hall spaghetti. Ice cream is a new favorite food for the children and sometimes is eaten with a strange utensil called a fork. The only regular source of news for the refugees at Fort Indiantown Gap is the camp newspaper called Good Land and printed in Vietnamese, English, Cambodian, and French. It's published by the Army. On July 3rd, the refugees read about a big celebration at the Gap planned for an American holiday called the Fourth of July. and the band was brassy and about the only thing missing from the celebration were fireworks and speeches by politicians running for office. The refugees had been in camp for little more than a month and there was a certain excitement for both the refugees and the Americans working at the camp in participating in the rediscovery of America. God bless America. Bless On July 4, 1776, the people in the United States declared their independence from England. To keep this freedom, a war was fought and won. Every year, a celebration is held throughout the land. This freedom, fought so hard for, belongs to everyone in the United States. Some of the refugees added a new dimension to the American Independence Day celebration with their own impromptu songs and games. After July 4th, the camp returned to business as usual. And for a refugee, that means making the best of a temporary situation, as seen in this essay developed by a Vietnamese refugee photographer. He calls it a refugee family's life in camp. In Vietnam, Mr. Tuan worked as a contractor while his wife operated a drugstore. Once a respected, wealthy businessman, he lost all his belongings with the demise of his country. Now at age 43, Tuan, his wife, and nine children must begin again.